presentation is allowed. We do ask that your camera or streaming device remain at or below shoulder level, not blocking the view of anyone behind you. Thank you for your cooperation and for being considerate of those around you. Enjoy the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Summer Scream. As fog billows through the streets of Ghost Town, the spirits of Calico will rise once again this Halloween as fans flow through the gates to celebrate the 51st season of Not Scary Farm. Here to discuss how they know what terrifies you are members of the Scary Farm's haunt team. Please welcome to the stage, manager of design and park decor, Jeff Shattuck. Good job. Area Manager of Wardrobe, Bill Meyer. Yeah. Scenic Designer, Daniel Miller. Show Director for Not Scary Farm, Jeff Tucker. And your host for this presentation, Production Specialist for Not Scary Farm, Pasta Rago. Thank you all for joining us on this wonderful panel today. We are excited to show some things and talk about what we love about the fog. Uh, I'm going to go down the line and give some introductions. Uh, Jeff, would you feel free to start us off with who you are? Jeff Shattuck, uh, manager of Park Decor. Um, I have been at Knott's for, oh, this is my 31st Halloween. <laughs> My very first year was in 1987. I worked in merchandise, and I worked in the tintype gallery. Weird little story. And I took photos. First night of Halloween, I walked in with makeup. That's back when uh, all associates could make themselves up, come to work in a costume. And I had managers all night looking at me, staring at me. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? What did I do? I thought I was going to get fired immediately. And so by the end of the night, they're like, will you come in and do this every single night of haunt and take pictures with the guests? That was my first haunt. 
<laughs> I got let go on the last night of Haunt because I had one more late than the girl. They had girl, they had another girl, so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> uh, and Bill. <laughs> Uh, my name is Bill Meyer, I'm the Area Manager of Wardrobe. I started in 1993, uh, hired into the wardrobe department. Um, that wasn't the job I was applying for at the time, but the woman saw my resume and said, well, I'm going to forward one over to the wardrobe department. They called me first. I interviewed the next day, started the next day. Uh, my first project, I think, for Scary Farm was uh, they needed somebody who was strong enough to cut industrial felt. And, <laughs> Everybody else in the shop was like 30 years at least older than I was, didn't have the strength, so I... Wait a minute, Bill. I was working there. Not even <laughs> Soon after I started there, you came back. <laughs> but I wasn't 30 years old. No, but you weren't 30 years old. Um, for a lot of our staff, it was their post-retirement job, and I was the young kid. Uh, to be able to carry stuff, lift stuff, I'm not that guy anymore. Um, I don't think any of us are, Bill. <laughs> All right, Daniel, and who are you? <laughs> I'm Daniel Miller. Um, I'm with Entertainment Design. Um, <laughs> I started uh, in 1998. My first uh, big design maze was uh, Carnival of Carnivorous Clowns. I've designed over 26 mazes for the park over the years, so I'm sort of the grandfather of design now, and they treat me like that. <laughs> mazes, shows. Well, and shows, and <laughs> even Christmas on ice and Snoopy. Lots of Christmas on ice. Yeah. Uh, all right, and our last person who we're going to talk about is Jeff Tucker. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Jeff Tucker. I started at Knott's in 1994 on my first Scary Farm. I worked in the Silver Dollar Saloon, which isn't even there anymore. And on my break, I used to go watch The Hanging in Calico Square. And I was just in awe. like. This is a thing you could do. And uh, seven years later, I was invited to help write the show. And I wrote all the stuff I ever wanted to write for all those years. And then, talk about that later. you'll do that later. And so then, uh, I've done a million jobs on farm. Uh, I write a lot of the stuff that you don't think gets written, like blurbs and maps, and website synopsis. And uh, sometimes I even write menus. So uh, if it's all kinds of writing, that's what I do, among other things. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, my name is Fosta, and uh, I have been up the farm since, not in the 90s, but uh, since 2006, where I started as a haunt talent in Lore of the Vampire, from being, at, I know, <laughs> from being there, I moved over and I was in charge of the entertainment page department for 11 years, so I have some production staff uh, behind me, and I have done a variety of different things on the farm. During Not Scary Farm, you'll see me running around making sure our talent are being talent and being scary. So, with that, I'm very excited. We have a lot of knowledge about the farm and about the event in general, and we are going to get this party started with talking about what we want to talk about. And this one is specifically, we want to talk about the creation of what you guys love about Scary Farm, which we are going to talk about one of our mazes. But can we play that video? <laughs> Oh, God, no, please. <laughs> <laughs> 
2019 and big reveal this year. This is our final year of Waxworks at Not Scary Farm. I know. <laughs> Fan favorite, long time running. We are going to talk a little bit about how this got started and we're going to have Daniel, who is the designer of that maze. Daniel, tell us a little bit about your inspiration for Waxworks and how we got started and what were you doing to make this maze come to life? Well, I know that we all love wax museums, and I think we think they're very creepy mannequins, wax museums, and um, it was suggested to me that we should really pitch this for Han. And even in, uh, this came out in 2018 or 19? 19, 19. The, the pitch originally that you made for it was in 2016, so, but... Right. <laughs> and people don't know this, but we originally pitched it for the boardwalk area, um, for right where the arcade is. Because um, the whole concept was this was an old wax museum on the boardwalk. But we decided to, uh, it moved twice. Once was in Wilderness Dance Hall, where we, had, we were going to make it all old Western Victorian wax museum. But then I really wanted the freedom to make it more 1960s, 1970s. And that's where it moved to its final position, which was in its, um, right now it's called Ghost Rider 1. Uh, right behind Ghost Rider. Um, the, what, there's a design process that I go through, which is up on the screens right now, uh, which is the first thing is we do is we pitch. Right around now is when we start to develop the pitches for the year next. So not for this coming on, but for uh, the next year. So our pitches usually start with a one-page pitch uh, with some research slapped together, and then we'll go to storyboards, um, where we um, draw it all out, each room to room. And I'd like to go between the ground plan and the storyboards. So here's all my storyboards. That shows all the different original artwork for the maze. I wanted to really create an environment that had this character that was kind of having a mental breakdown and um, wanted to go more than just the normal wax museum where, and you see this at a lot of haunts where we do the statue scare where people are on a pedestal and they sit like rigid and then they boo scare you. Uh, but I really wanted to make it very twisted. What would make me scared? I'm really into body horror. Like, uh, like the, the, the more so the, the, the animatronics of the people coming out of other people and yeah. the, the people mending together. Yeah. So when you're going, when you're looking at some of these, the some of them, as you can see, you have the, the, uh, the spinning the spinning platform that has all the pieces on it. How did you come up with some of these inspirations for these specific horror type of... I really want to give it like a modern art spin. I really wanted to have him think he is an artist and he's going to make these masterpieces throughout the maze. So I decided to make three major masterpieces that will go throughout. There's other better visuals of that. Um, this, this goes right to the ground, but this is, this is our bare bones, minimal of what we do. Um, at, we use Vectorworks, and we draw every room from a top-down position, every scare position, um, every prop we put in, and we color code it, uh, put all the walls in. Everything is based on this ground plan. Um, and it is the crux of how we will go back and forth. The next thing we'll do is lists where we bring in each of our departments, because this is, it's very critical, it's definitely not just me, it's the creativity of our entire um, department, which is props, lighting, paint, paint special <laughs> effects, she led paint for several years. I did. Uh, this, this ground plan is literally the base of Not Scary Farm, of all of our mazes. This is how they are created and this is how they are produced. Everybody has one, whether it is the sound, audio, lighting, Anybody who has a field, this is what is going to bring your nightmares to life. Yeah. So this is an example of our elevations and how detailed they get. So we put up the elevations. That's one of the masterpieces. It's a rotating stage uh, with skin. You saw that in the video earlier. We have our big facade that's crumbling. And... Um, we definitely had the, the Devil's Den facade for a second there, too, if you guys remember that little prank we played on you guys from Ghost Rider. <laughs> so each of these mazes have to have like a, a code name because the year before this, we had a couple of people kind of break, not break in, but they, they, they looked were, at our plans through the city and we had to now change our names. So every maze has a, has a code name. 
So what we're saying is it's everybody's fault out there. No, yes, no, not ours. We didn't do it. Uh, so, but this is the paint elevation. It's the, the type of stuff I will give over to the paint department with special swatches of each color. Uh, and we go into more detail of each elevation and break it down wall to wall. As you can see, each maze, uh, Daniel, you want to tell us about how you color coded it and what is some of your, like as you can see in the top corner, there's this giant portrait that is, tell us a little bit about how you have the storyboarding and what was your feel of your ideas through the maze when you're trying to go through, what are you trying to get the guests to get? Well, the first part of the maze is definitely a, a replication of a waxworks that's been on fire and is burning down. We wanted to create different rooms that are iconic. We used to have up the road from Knott's Berry Farm, uh, Movie Land Wax Museum, and it sort, of, it sort of served as an inspiration for us. Um, and we put in a Patriots room. That's the background. Uh, George Washington uh, crossing the Delaware is that, that background. We have melted uh, wax figures uh, in, posed in there. So each of the three or four rooms, the first three or four rooms, are based off of a classic uh, wax museum. The rest of it is like the backstage where it gets very disturbing and dark, uh, where we go through a smelting room and we'll go through um, a sculpting room and you get to see his uh, wax or his masterpieces on full display. So there's kind of two sides when you're looking at this maze and the maze design. You have the display pieces or the exhibits and then you have the backstage where the real horror happens. Is that correct? Correct. So let's talk a little bit about when we're creating these spaces and the environments that you've created because we want people to feel that they really are within these elements of this wax museum. So this is an example of what our, uh, a lot of what our props team does. They, they mostly handle all the sculpture. So this, uh, this middle one is really disturbing. It's our third masterpiece and it's just, uh, I, I make a maquette for it, uh, which is like a small clay uh, sculpture in scale and give it over to our sculptors. Our sculptor actually went above and beyond. He created this incredible movie masterpiece in itself. Um, we came up with the idea pretty late in the process. We were almost into like- Bees. Art. Yeah, for bees, like where does the wax come from? So we said, and what were people really freaked out by? Bees. So we said, hey, this video mapping was kind of new at the time. It's like, let's video map all these bees on this incredible sculpture of, of uh, that is kind of melted into this, um, uh, these, all these bees gathering. So. This is an example of how uh, research can go right into the actual work. Um, this was my drawing for the Candelabra character, which is the second masterpiece. Um, I got inspired by this pretty closely to this one great artist over here. Um, and I transferred it all to her being a candelabra. I, we also added an effect for the mouth to move up and down, so it always indicates that she's still living, like everything is living in this wax museum. Uh, this is uh, this is what I talked about earlier. Which the maquette. Uh, so this is the original maquette and uh, the original drawing, which shows basically overall size. But I do trust our prop department to actually go above and beyond, and they do an incredible job of actually um, making the true horror of this. So, so as you know that with you saw a little bit about the mazes and how it is done, Daniel, let's talk about what you're creating the characters that go into these mazes. As you can see that you have your character sketches here and the character sheets. Tell us a little bit about, and Bill, if you wouldn't like to, if you would mind to touch in, is how do you create these spaces them to fit within the environment? We talked about the maquettes. We talked about how people are always the animatronics are always technically living. We talked about the bees, but let's talk about the, when we put the actors into the environment. What was some of your inspiration, and how did they come to life? So, what I learned when I did uh, uh, I love this place, Asylum was I gave everyone a backstory. I said, you know what, I had time. I'm going to write a backstory for every character. I still have my backstory from when yeah. I was a nurse in asylum. So this one I doubled down. Every character had a backstory. Not every maze gets this treatment. So I wanted to create every character, draw them out, and give them all a very complete, very twisted background so they have a reason to be there. It also inspires... Now, most of you won't see any of this. 
unless you see the, the actor really portraying the backstory. Or you're casted to that role. Yes. So the cast sees the backstory, they get all the inspiration, and then they can really fill what this, what this is. We give them little sayings. Um, Basta's the one who, who directs many of them. I do direct them on what to say and what not to say. I'm sorry in advance, or I'm not sorry in advance, depending. <laughs> and we try to be as twisted as possible. Uh, Bill, when you're creating these costumes and you're making the and you're talking about these characters, once Daniel comes to you with these original character sketches, how do, what's some of the process that you go through to make some of these characters come to life? Daniel draws great pictures, um, but we had to then build it into something that would be worn. Some of the things he draws. <laughs> anyway. Um, we, we then had to go through, uh, we removed, like on the first guy, the curator there, we love the idea of the mask and the bandages, but the, the things that were his head was originally, so this isn't realistic, nobody will keep this job, they'll quit, we'll have to recast this every single night. So we, that was one of those things that we, we took away from that. Uh, we take his ideas and his images and use these for our inspiration as to what we're going to build. Again, it looks great on the page, but these people have to wear this costume for eight hours a day, 30 nights a, a month, you know what I mean? And so hours, eight and, hours a day. And it has to be launderable. Yes, we do wash our costumes. It may not scary smell like it when you walk through the page, but yes, we do launder those. That's a different kind of scary. <laughs> Agreed. It is, yes. Live in that warehouse. With the costumes. Like my department does. <laughs> That's so fair. At the end of the night, you will open the door in the morning, and it's like, whoa. <laughs> and the more humid it is, the worse it is. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so not only do the costumes, they have to be functional, right? And so you're, part of your challenge is to make sure that the talent are comfortable, they can scare in them, and we still want them to be, look creepy and scary. Correct. Um, a lot of these things we, in my shop, we source, we built from scratch. Um, thankfully, you know, there's a lot of people who just need pants and shirts. I have pants and shirts because in addition to dealing with costumes, I also deal with all the uniforms for the park. So we were able to take some old shirts, old pants, uh, dye them, distress them into making them into look bad. The Maryland dresses we had to build from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we do. But we make them look bad quite often. We, we had a woman that joined my department years ago, and then she built something and was heartbroken when we had to then trash it. She didn't understand. What, she'd never been to Scary Farm before. She didn't understand that we were going to take her pride, her joy, and, and trash destroy it. it. Yeah. Um, and then she did it. And she saw. Oh, it's cute. I guess <laughs> she didn't know what word to use, but. She was proud of it, but then when she saw the big picture, her part of the story, she really appreciated being able to do that. And that's really what all of the costume designs, the element, is we're trying to tell you guys a story and so you can really like live in that environment. When you walk into that dilapidated, burning building, we want the characters to fit within the world. So unfortunately for the person who made that costume, it would look a little weird if the white Maryland dress was just in this burning building. Um, One more thing, sorry. and then. Real quick, we have to go back and then make sure that this maze looks different than all the other mazes. One thing we did for Waxworks, this was a great picture to hear to show it. Uh, he talked about the bees, he talked about the beeswax. We went through and over dyed everything in a light yellow. Basically to give you that idea, you may not see it, but we had to make this maze stand on its own. We had to, I mean, what's the point of having what, 10 different mazes if they all look alike? Or black and gray. Right? Yeah, that has, gray, a, exactly. has a different feel to it. Each one has to have its own feeling to it. Uh, it, it can't look like a hand-me-down. It's got to look original. It's got to look unique on its own. Daniel, with the final with the final year of Waxworks, can you tell us a little bit? Uh, as you all know, in video games, we're all video game people, or hopefully, or comic book. We love a good Easter egg here. We hide Easter eggs throughout the park, throughout all of our venues. Daniel, would you like to tell us a little bit about the Easter eggs that people can look forward to in the final year of Waxworks? Sure. Most of our Easter eggs revolve around them linking to either other mazes. Or, um, so the, this first one is the woman in Tipton Wax. She came straight from a, a, one of my favorite mazes, Doll Factory. So, yeah, I mean, the, mo the model, everything. I think we may have added the tutu. I was going to say, I think everything about that, 
about that figurine in the smelting room is pretty original minus the tutu. I think the tutu yeah. had to be replaced, but every that is straight out of Doll Factory. We have an entire prop warehouse that has tons of hot knowledge. Um, next to it is the maquette for the first masterpiece, which is um, it's kind of fun. It now lives in the layer room where uh, the, the um, it's like right before the doll factory room. Um, so if you you can find it's hard to see, but it's sort of tucked in the back by his toilet. It is his living quarters. His living quarters. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Um, the, first, the next one is dolls that actually existed in our Pinocchio and Strong Man's. We have this little marionette um, theater that is like the first turn you get to see. Those were from the Pinocchio and Strong Man's. And the last one's more of a funny story. Um, Daniel, tell us why that man is in that position. <laughs> That's a model of me. No, <laughs> um, no, no. We got this body the night, like a, a day before. We opened, so we quickly shoved it into place. This was in one of the wax. Um, this is near the exit. Correct, and uh, it was completely naked, anatomically correct. So, <laughs> so we had a prop person run out to Walmart and get extra, extra large underwear. So they can... It was true. There was a, a very naked dead body in the prop warehouse that everybody was very concerned about. <laughs> Scary in a different way. Scary in a different way. And we spray glued it on, so... And the, yeah, don't try to take them off, please. Thank you. <laughs> um, Daniel, with this being... Challenging <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it, please. <laughs> Weird. Uh, it's going to be one of those new things. It's like, you know, some people try to steal the apple from Disney and it's going to be trying to get the underwear off the guy who buys works. <laughs> oh, security's going to help me for this. <laughs> uh, anyways, with the final year of Waxworks, do you have any final thoughts about the venue, Daniel, and things that you would like to say to the, the group about seeing it for the last year of the fog? No, just go enjoy it for one last time. I mean, it, I, I think I've been really creeped out by it. It has a great atmosphere. Um, oh, this no. was uh, sorry. I mean, this is uh, they asked about what, how do we update things. This actually was updated last year, and we had a character by the name of the Collector who gouges out eyeballs and hangs them up. So we modified our um, Chamber of Horrors to be to include this character. Um, yeah, this used to be just uh, you the, walked by and saw monsters. It was inside. the invisible, the invisible, invisible man, man and the wolf man. Uh, so we did add an addition to the maze to send it off last year, knowing that it would be its final year. We try to give the, all of our old mazes or our returning mazes some love, regardless of how many years they are with the foot wet. We try to give them some love every year. <laughs> and, <laughs> you're next, sorry. Surprise! Uh, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it's Jeff. Uh, but, Daniel, is that, do you have any other final notes for the yeah, group? Just go and enjoy it. Have fun. So, yes, please come and see Waxworks on its final year in the fog, and um, please don't try to steal the underwear off of the dead guy. That is all I have to say about Waxworks this year. You just created a TikTok challenge. Yeah. I am so sorry, marketing in advance. Um, I see up. a blackout by that character this year. I know, right? That's going to be a new blackout position. <laughs> um, we'll be casting that if you uh, want to come. So now that you learned a little bit specifically about one of our things that make not scary farm special, our mazes, we're going to kind of go into an overall about the park because not only is uh, do we have mazes, we have street zones, but our park is very much part of our history here at Scary Farm, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things we do at the park, and that will lead me into Jeff. Tucker in the history of entertainment. Hello. So Jeff, you've been with the farm for, as we know, a long time. How many shows do you think you have written for Scary Farm alone? At least 50. At least? At least 50, yeah. Because there's always something to write, all these different tiny shows that we've done. Uh, I even wrote a show that never performed, which I thought was great. We did a show in 2012 called Mephisto's Mechanical Mayhem, where the whole gag was... Was they the, per the performer dies? He, he dies right before the show starts, and people would just get mad that they waited for a show oh, that never I'll never happened. forget that. Yeah, people would wait for... It was on the map 
up and everything, people would wait for a show that the performer died That in. was very funny. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I've written a bunch of shows. Uh, I started working on The Hanging in 2001 as a, as a, a, a writer who just added stuff. Uh, there was already a good team in place, but I just added my two cents. And I did that for 10 years. And then I moved on to all kinds of other things. I've written shows for Birdcage, uh, Professor Freak's Funhouse, Dr. Cleaver. Uh, I did three shows at Mystery Lodge, Unearthed, Possessed, and uh, uh, Invitation to Terror. So yeah, I'll, I, and Scary Farm is about this whole experience, right? You you go thinking you're I'm gonna hit all the mazes, then you like you see a show, and when you get home, the mazes and the stuff that you wanted to see were great, but the stuff that surprised you that you didn't know, that's the stuff you really remember. I wasn't expecting that. You were usually that's where the fun is usually at, is it's the least expecting. Um, so last year, speaking of unexpected returns and things, we brought back the hanging. So bring. <laughs> After we had killed it off, I know, uh, we killed off the hanging and we brought it back. Can we talk a little bit about the history of killing the hanging and bringing it back and resurrecting it in Wagon Camp? Yeah, so the hanging had a fantastic run of starting out as a real scary type show, morphing into a pop culture show. It was on Calico... It was originally The Hanging of the Witch, right? Yeah, uh-huh. It, it started on Calico Square, which doesn't even exist anymore. It moved to the Calico Mind stage, and we reached a point in pop culture where people just lost their sense of humor. And people would just watch the show and get upset and write all these terrible things. And I got all these nasty phone calls one year about the show, uh, which was fun. And um, then we decided we could bring it back for the big 50 anniversary, right? So we brought it back. And how was that experience? And how was it received? Uh, it was fantastic, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, me and Ken worked on the script for about a year. We knew a, a year out that we were going to do it. It kept constantly changing. But the real uh, magic element to it was putting it in the wagon camp. Because now suddenly you couldn't just walk by and see the show. You couldn't have your IC and go, what did they just say about Justin Bieber? What? I'm going to write a letter. Instead, you had to come in. And you had to know you were going to get offended by coming yeah. in. Yeah. We had a sign out front that said, if you're one of those people that gets mad and writes crap on the internet, get the hell out. We don't want you in here. I would actually like to let you know, the sign got a guest complaint. I know, because I got the email about it. So, <laughs> we most certainly did get guest complaints about the sign, but... I'm upset. This, this ice cream is cold. <laughs> It, it was too be scary. scary farm if we didn't get complaints. Yeah. You're not wrong. <laughs> Which was ironic because last year uh, the show had a specific script, and then we did our preview event where the noose dropped out, and I stood on the stage and I watched people just go crazy that this show was back. It definitely was a fan favorite, and to watch it come to come to life was really exciting. Yeah. So, so I mean, we went back immediately and we wrote a new ending, and the original hanging victim was thrown out, and instead we hanged Karens, and... It was so cathartic to, like, have a character on stage as your proxy, like, that's just me yelling, you know, your reign of terror is over, we're hanging you, and she says, I want to speak to the manager. <laughs> and he goes, tell him hi, in hell. Yeah, it was great. Was that, uh, writing the ending of The Hanging, especially after, like, bringing it back for so long, what are some things that you can say about bringing it back? Like, was there, what was that one pivotal moment? Was it the noose dropping at the preview event that you were just super, just stoked to have it yeah, back? Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of the show. Like I said, I used to watch it on my break and go, oh my god, and then having a chance to work on it with so many amazing people, just, we're going to bring it back, and I'm going to be the guy that directs it now. It's a lot of work, and it's a lot of people that put their heart and soul writing. on that stage, right? And the idea that when that news came down, like, writing the script is tough, because it's a pop culture show, and pop culture used to last a long time. Something that happened in March, you could talk about it in September, and people would go, I remember that. Now you talk about something in August, and they go, no idea. <laughs> So it's an ever-evolving script. How many revisions of The Hanging was there last year? Last year there was about 40. 
40 different scripts with all and, and each one of those had a different plot a different idea of how to bring the hangman and the lawman back uh, there were all these different ways we were going to do it we were going to have the the doctor strange circle open up and they jumped out and uh, finally we decided they were just in storage and they came out of storage and that was like the the magic moment of like this is going to be really great uh, we do put a lot of things in storage so i guess it would kind of fit sense yeah. that we would put the hanging in storage too <laughs> put it in storage and and the best part if you remember last year we didn't even use a noose there was not a noose ever on the gallows instead they used the no boot necklace <laughs> We can make fun of ourselves too. Um, one thing that I thought was very uh, admirable about the hanging last year was all of the amount of the set of the hanging from last year for the 50th. Some of those were the real maze signs from the old venue. So we definitely pulled it out of storage. So I guess it would be fitting that the hangman did come out of storage. Yeah, that it was year. great. Um, speaking of shows and things like that, uh, we also have to do things about costumes. So Bill, not only are you in charge of costuming our talent at Not Scary Farm, give us a little bit of what you do for not only for the shows, how they have developed over the years. Because you, you not only did the original hanging costuming, you had to do the hanging this year on top of all of our Ted mazes, on top of our five scare zones no, okay, and all of our shows. Okay, when she says me, she's, she's talking about my staff. She's not talking about me. Um, no, not him, his team. My team, there we go. Um, through the years, we've got some great pictures here. Um, the one, the vampire at the top, the center. Basically, there was a while that after we moved away from building stuff out of industrial felts in the 90s, <laughs> um, the idea was that if we, we could go and find stuff in, in thrift stores. This was a, a wedding dress or a prom dress that was taken. We, they went, one of my stitchers uh, had friends with a, a thrift store and they, they bought all the light colored prom dresses one year and we over dyed them. You can see how well that dyed red. It didn't. <laughs> um, it may have been the first night, but the more we honored it, it, it turned pink. They definitely change colors uh, through some of the run. But so as you can see, like that is a wedding dress that has been over dyed. We are very resourceful when it comes to um, some of our characters. So when we're building the mazes now, especially, it's changed a lot because before there used to be a lot of rag robes, there Correct. used to be a lot of sewer capes. Now every single one of our costume pieces, like you can see she in waxwork. Yes, she mentioned the rag robes. They were 100% cotton. The only thing they did well was absorb sweat. That's true. And they were a nightmare pulling them out of the washer. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Because they were all covered in scare cloth so all the scare cloth would get tangled together and we'd sit there for hours with scissors cutting them apart i worked That's in a wardrobe for a while so they, they it would was get a tied nightmare. together they would get tied together those those they get shorter and shorter and shorter <laughs> because we have to keep cutting them um and again things have evolved we had we had for a while the pig twins were out in rag robes <laughs> Then they were in the fat suits. They were in the, yes, they were in the fat suits. We've rebuilt those things. Again, those fat suits, they used to just be, again, sponges. Body pods. Yeah. Uh, now they're, they're more uh, pod-like, uh, so they're, they're much cooler, much easier to wear. Um, some of the other things, you know, again, we have to add, we, we, we rely a lot for our costumes on our great performers that come in. Uh, because every once in a while somebody will say, great, I love what you're giving me, but I have this that I would like to add to my costume. And every once in a while something they add makes that character. Sometimes they try to bring stuff that just... They develop their own character. Oh, yeah, don't exactly. make the character either. Yeah. And they take what we've given them and they take it well beyond that. Um, again, you can see through the years we had, there's a basically a cheerleader that was built out of double knit that had been sitting on the shelf for 30 years. We didn't know That's what to do with fabrics. So we catch it, it high. Catch it high. Catch it high, yes. Um, so we built that. Um, again, up on the top, the, the makeup prosthetics. Back years ago, we used to paint our prosthetics with, uh, basically it was a textile paint because we liked the way that it stuck to the prosthetics. We discovered maybe it wasn't the best thing to put on people's skin, <laughs> but it stayed on the prosthetics very well. Um, things have evolved since there. They say it wasn't harmful, but it wasn't necessarily the best thing. 
There's one of the there, original the pigs. Big twins. There right we go. There. Yeah. So as you can see in this slide here, uh, so not only do we have to wardrobe cast and bill, we have to paint all these people. Not only do we have to paint 720 talent alone, we have over 40 different stage performers and things like that. So there, you have quite a bit of an operation. Talk a little bit about your staff and your team in the wardrobe building while Scary Farm is going on. By the way, we open at seven, so think of the number of how many people so tell Sounds us a little good. bit about that. Well, okay, well beyond before we actually get to the makeup room, basically we've been sculpting, we've been foaming. All those prosthetics basically get produced in shop. They all get produced on our farm. The last several years, not only have we been using our own prosthetics, but we've been doing a lot of our masks as well. Masks, hands. I mean, I could, I could order them out of a catalog, but then they just look like they've been ordered out of a catalog. <laughs> Um, this way, uh, it is it is our signature. It is us. Basically, our first makeup of the night. Most of the makeup start about five o'clock. About eight thirty, everybody who's in makeup has already been through my department. We're already done. That's about this year with the added people. We're looking at about four hundred people in makeup every single night if they show up. <laughs> <laughs> There's that too. <laughs> Each, each, I've got 43 artists in the room. Basically, most of the makeup times take 20 minutes to apply. I just want to point out, it's like you see, the trio in the top, the guy in the fedora, that's me. Aww. Is it really? Yeah, that's me. That was a Ed Alonzo photo shoot from 2001. <laughs> wow. Sorry, I just had Tim Clega next to me too there. Um, Again, then by that time, everybody's out, they're working. Um, half my staff goes home, the other half, they're getting ready, painting prosthetics for the next night to get ready to go. So 400 people every single night come through your building to get out of our, that's just makeup. Just makeup. So think about the amount of staff that's going through. Do you have just like a, a like a vat of airbrush paint somewhere in the back? <laughs> Um, you know what? We have become great friends with the new airbrush provider, yes. I love it. <laughs> uh, Not well, to mention all the people that get thrown in at the last minute, too. Special guests and things like that that they media. have to accommodate, media and all that as well. Or the random person from management says, I want to go play tonight. We don't do that anymore, Jeff. No, no we never do that. <laughs> So, Bill, your department is uh, very extensive, and not only do you have to do makeup, you guys also do wigs. We do wigs. Um, actually, when I say we, I'm going to say she. Tony. I've got, I've got Tony on staff, basically, who does, I'm going to say, well, the very few wigs that she doesn't do, she has trained somebody to do with her and for her. Does that make sense? Um, again, uh, she, she started with us as an usher, moved over to our department as a stitcher, costume builder now, and is doing wigs for us. For Scary Farm overall, how many, like when we're talking about the makeup and wigs, how many costume pieces, and not only that, we have props and accessories when it comes to that, how many pieces overall do you think you have created for just Scary Farm alone, let's just say for the 50th? This is big math, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Carry the one. Carry the one. Um, Okay, so here's the thing. Basically, when Daniel writes the maze, and it says there are four people, I have to be able to provide costumes for anybody walking through that door. Anybody. Doesn't matter shape, size, height. Doesn't matter. I have to be prepared. So when we only, in his mind, we only have to build four costumes. Reality, usually it's like eight costumes we have to build in a range of sizes. Correct. That's awesome. So what would you say about, what? Let's say like 3,000 costume pieces. Uh, yeah. Easy. Easy. Uh, easy. 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 Um, we've got costume pieces that we have built when we built that maze. Again, that maze may have, you may only see 20 people in that maze. We've, there are 40 people working in that maze, but we've probably built 80, 85, 90, maybe 100 costume pieces. And then not only when you guys are building it, sometimes you have to make additional okay. backup costumes for the props, for the props. For the props yeah. and also make additional backups because you're designing the maze one year that same fabric might not be available in two years correct if the maze is around that long so they're making extras and not to mention all the backstop of fabric we, you have we basically maze. when we when we're building these costumes we're looking we make sure that we've got enough supplies on hand to be able to replace this for the next five years at least 
Um, <laughs> we're, we're choosing fabrics. We're choosing stuff that is not like that prom dress that was just over time. <laughs> we would never do that now because it would never last. Um, again, we had probably many fewer nights that, at that point. Um, that's, we, that's not how we play the game now. And we used to have to dry clean things, yes. Yeah, we don't dry clean. We do all of our own wardrobing and laundering at Not Scary Farm. So very exciting news for you guys if you didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> but Bill, thank you so much for your time and to tell us a little bit more about bringing the, bringing the life to the park and the event. Like images and photo ops that you see throughout the park, Jeff Shattuck. <laughs> As you can tell, I've held a lot of positions. I've worked on the hanging, I've worked on the shows, I've worked in wardrobe, so I know a little bit about all of these areas, believe it or not. So for being the old man in the group, yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about how you, for the 50th, you really overdid it. You, you had a lot of different things. You overdid the park. Tell us a little bit about the history of the main gate. We, you, we really saw a change in the bringing back of the yeah. chandeliers and stuff. Tell us a little bit about your vision and how you ended up coming with this concept. So when I first took over Park Decor 20, years ago there was one area of the park that was actually decorated and that was ghost town that was it I mean it was scare cloth a few skeletons and that was it scary farm hadn't really been pushed out to the extent that it is now so uh, as we we're coming along I'm like okay how do I tell a story in the park decor so my thought was scary farm is the death of the park and it's a giant funeral and everything is coming to life it's a all, dead man's party it's a dead man's party so that's why the main gate is all draped in funeral bunting and then last year they threw a little extra money my way so i got to <laughs> really go all out and we created the main gate last year celebrating 50 years of history through advertising art celebrating the first year and then every fifth year i told my boss hey i want to take all the chandeliers down at the main gate and he's like why because <laughs> i got to get maintenance involved and a lot of things involved in that and rewiring i said i want to hang 15 skull chandeliers and he's like really and I'm like, yes really that's what i want to do and he's like all right so here we go 15 chandeliers being swapped out every year now I mean, you definitely. <laughs> oops. Uh, yeah. Oops. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> but, so with, it was the 50th. You really went all out, as you said before. That before it used to just really be ghost town at the yes. main gate. Uh, this year, it's definitely now the entire park, wherever you look, has some sort of visual that you can see, whether it is an activation or whether it is something on the lines. Last year we saw a really big uptick in Carnival and the redoing of the boardwalk. We gave some love to the clowns. Tell us a little bit about what your inspiration was for the boardwalk last year. So normally entertainment will design a lot of things for different areas. They come up with the scare zones and I will usually do some decor to match. So entertainment had some big things on their plate last year and I'm like, you know, I'm just gonna take over Carnival and make it work. So I was like, what, what is it? What is Carnival? It's a carnival that has been abandoned and all these crazy clowns took over. So that started the process. I have an amazing new team of people. I have some people that are great with electronics and uh, they're like, let's make these ticket booths. And then we recorded some people uh, they're crazy clowns and the ticket booth is always closed and every once in a while they open it and they're doing horrible disgusting things in the ticket booth. <laughs> I will say when you came up with the ticket booths, um, I called Park Decor because there was, or I called uh, Park Services because there was a spilled slushy on one yes. of them and I literally thought it was a split slushy on the props and I had to call somebody to come clean it up. So if you ever want to see about how real some of these set pieces are that you created, you fooled me. <laughs> I love it. No, but it wasn't a call about somebody on a roof. Uh, that Steve. Steve. <laughs> See? Steve. For those of you who don't know what Steve is, Steve is one of our lantern activations that was in Ghost Town last year, and he could be, uh, Jeff was the creator of Steve. So for those of you who all hail Steve, you remember Steve. Funny story about Steve. Pasta texts me, it's, I don't know, it must have been 11 o'clock. She's like, I just got a phone call from someone, and they said, 
when, since when did we allow talent on the roof of Chow House? I, I think I didn't stop laughing for 20 minutes at home. I, I was laughing so hard. True story, that did happen. I got a radio call that said, uh, why is there a talent on the Chow House? And I was, if you've ever seen one of our talent running around in Ghost Town, who has the angel wings, the angel of death talent, uh, she was not on the Chow How roof. That is Steve. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you. She did not actually end up on the roof. <laughs> Every time I see that person, I bring it up. No, we don't allow talent on Chow House. <laughs> we still won't allow talent on Chow House. Yeah. So, process of developing everything for Carnival. So, the top right photo is 1950s chalk art clowns that your grandmother maybe had hanging on her wall. That was the inspiration for the direction that all of these pieces came from. Now granted, these are large fiberglass pieces that I was having made. That, this process started in January the year before because all these pieces were made overseas for us and then brought over on container ships. So everything you see, so that bottom, that photo underneath the inspiration photo, that was the sculpt that I was approving. And we went through a large process and then they send me drawings and things like that. And then you can see the final paint as it came. There was one step in between where I had always said, I need to have them cracked and broken and look like they've been sitting there for 50 years abandoned. And they painted them. And so sometimes when you're working overseas, there's communication difficulties and they didn't have any cracks and I was like no 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 they gotta look cracked and so they went back and they physically went in and to cracked. the fiberglass and cracked the fiberglass and so there's actually a lot more texture in them than I thought I was getting and then they went in and darkened it all and I was like oh I really like that even more now <laughs> so, so it worked in our benefit it did it worked in my benefit so Destroying things Destroying with purpose. Things for with purpose, absolutely. Hey, real quick, Jeff. The best part about that is the idea that the guy's like bringing his kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was just hey. to show the scale, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. In case there's any kids here, here's how big it is. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Grab the kid by the neck. <laughs> or it could be me. I could be me and somebody I work with. He was the connector. <laughs> Right by my office, these were all lined up, and every night I had to walk past them, uh, completely quiet, and I was just freaking out. Uh, I will say they are quite fun to see when the Christmas decorations, and there's that changeover from Scary Farm to Christmas, so you have like giant Christmas trees and evil clouds. <laughs> In my department, the holidays completely collide. It's like, it's because it's two week turnover, we've got Halloween coming out, and Christmas sitting backstage, and, and, and it's like, what's going and what's coming and so it's it's a quite a freaky thing to see <laughs> so not only last year did you go you went above and beyond with carnival we had a new land open up last year with fiesta give us a little tell us a little bit about your inspiration i mean that before it was under construction for so long we didn't we had a party there and now we have a different theme over there tell us a little bit about what you did for your installation in fiesta last year so we wanted to build it up, make it a little more. We weren't sure if we were gonna have a true scare zone there or not last year, so they were relying on me because we, we are actively trying to make the entire park scary farm. So we wanted to give something, somebody, you know, something for everybody in every land to do. Uh, this was a display that I thought would be really fun and it was also a way for me to be able to buy the platform for the Christmas tree that we put out there at Christmas time. So I was like, well, I'll put this gazebo on it and we'll do this. And we just repurposed some of the figures that we had been using out there for many years. So, but it gave us a nice little space. Uh, this one this year may or may not get an upgrade on it. So speaking of things that may or may not have gotten an upgrade, last year you had quite a bit of a challenge to when it came to not only setting up these giant things, we had these things called lanterns. Yes. So Jeff's department is one of the many departments that not only did we have lantern activations in the mazes, we had some very exciting lantern activations throughout the park, like Steve. Tell us a little bit about my favorite activation that you had last year in Forsaken Lake. Yeah. So this gazebo 
piece I have been seeing for many years every January when I go to uh, a show that I go purchase decor for and I kept seeing it and seeing it I'm like I want to buy it I want to buy it I want to buy it what am I going to do with it when I thought oh lantern activation oh my gazebo so I'm like I want to buy them and so I bought them immediately. I didn't know exactly what it was going to be, but then it turned into what it is. It was actually funny. Daniel heard that we were doing a piece because things were moving very quickly last year to it figure out all fast. this lantern stuff. And he's like, what are you doing in Forsaken Lake? That's my area. I'm like, don't worry. It'll fit in perfect. It's going to look great. And so he's like, okay. So. I have someone on my team who is amazing with electronics and he's like, let's turn it into a lantern activation. So it just grew and grew. Um, it may or may not be getting an upgrade this year as well. well I it's don't pretty know. soon going to be the entire zone. I can see it now. For Walk through Forsaken Lake. Yes. The lantern activation. So, <laughs> and, and we just, I, I like to just make an entire environment in our scenes, like the main gate statement, the Forsaken Lake statement, the bigger the better. The bosses look at me and go, you need how much to do this? And I'm like, well, hey, come on, it's gonna be great. <laughs> well, I mean, you're turning over the entire park, not only, or right. we, we can't be, it has to be spooky all the year round. And it has Absolutely. to be guest friendly during the get, the, 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 the guest the, That is always a challenge for me because everything I do has to play at night as, and during the day, so it's not too scary for young kids. Hey Jeff, I saw this uh, piece backstage for a long time, waiting, yeah. and it was it's huge. It is. And I'll be honest, I thought it was going to be like a coffee shop. <laughs> it does, it's the size of a small gift. I walked by and I'm like, I can't wait to buy a Frappuccino in there. <laughs> That's how big it was. It is big, and it was all it was all the parts and pieces were laying around everywhere, and people were like, "What is this thing?" Because it's a lot of larger pieces that go together to create a larger piece. Actually, the two front columns are actually what's at our booth today, and the fencing is from first that, and Yeah. So if you swing by our booth after this, you can actually go see part of the set piece. Yeah. All right, Jeff, thank you so much for helping to, for bringing uh, the park to life and making it truly spooky. It is such an, it's exciting to see. One of the mazes will be open with the lights on so you can take pictures. Tickets go on sale. August 5th. August 5th. And to make it really cool, they're not going to sell a lot of tickets, so it's not going to be crazy busy. It's going to be just busy enough to be badass, right? So... Get the tickets as quickly as you can before they sell out. I'll be there. It's gonna. We're all gonna be there. It's gonna be so much fun, and we're gonna unveil everything that's waiting for Scary Farm 2024, baby. All right, and with that, I would like to say thank you guys for joining us for the Not Scary Farm panel this year, and hopefully we will see you in the fog. That's right. Pasta, everybody. Nice work.